Good afternoon. I guess we've heard a lot of, uh, about theory from uh, some of the other presentations, so I'm now going to give you some real life examples uh, and talk you through the sort of the journey that we've gone through as a business uh, in terms of personalization. So I'm going to talk a bit about what personalization actually means to us, what our kind of vision for, for data is. I'm going to talk about the groundwork that we had to do before we could actually do any tailoring or personalization of content. I'm going to talk a bit about our names. We're going to look at segmentation, talk about tailoring of, of products, um, respecting the, the customer's uh, wishes and how they want to be communicated with. I'm going to reveal some results, see whether it's actually been all, all worth it or not. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've got planned next. So a little bit of background. Uh, I work for a company called Last Word. We're a, we're a media business. We work in the, the investment space. Um, we're headquartered here in London. We've got offices over in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, we've got four main brands. We produce websites, magazines. We run 80, 90 odd events uh, globally every year. Uh, we operate across Western Europe, South Africa, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and, and various other places uh, in Asia. But more importantly, we send about 2 million emails each month uh, across the business. If you've studied marketing or communications, you've probably come across this quote. Um, John Wanamaker, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And what he was talking about was, was, was print advertising. You publish something, some of the right people might see it, but you don't know who those people are. And really, any email that's, that's not being tailored exactly the same as any kind of mass marketing. Personalization is all about having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And what we must always remember is that every recipient is different. Everyone has different hopes and fears and desires. They're all individuals. They're just like us. They all behave in slightly, slightly different ways. So we need to talk to people in, in different ways. And it's our kind of responsibility as email marketers to actually care about what we're sending to to individuals. So at last word, the business basically posed a, a question. They wanted to know who are our, our customers and how can we get them more engaged? And there were several reasons that the, the business wanted to do this. Firstly, on our kind of uh, news side of the business, they wanted to get people to read more newsletters, which would generate more traffic to the website, which would create more page infantry, so there'd be more opportunities for the sales team to go and sell digital advertising, more revenue. On the event side of the business, we've got more delegates to come along, we've got happier sponsors, we've got sponsors who are going to come back and sponsor events, again, more revenue being generated. And the business recognised that the, the only way that we're going to be able to tailor people's experience, be able to tailor products, is through data. So there's a need to start collecting more data about people. But the other side is the actual customer itself. To actually improve the customer experience and what they are receiving, the only way that we are going to do that is to start understanding exactly who they are and what they want. So at the very start, when I joined Last Word three years ago, we were a business entirely based on spreadsheets. Every event had a separate spreadsheet, every magazine had a separate spreadsheet, every newsletter had a separate spreadsheet. There were a couple of silo systems. There was a website that collected some data. There was a, an email broadcast platform. Nothing talked to each other. So the first thing we did was centralize all our data into, into one platform. We linked up, uh, we took Elestra on board, we linked that all up, and we created a, a single view of, of the customer. Once we put all the data in, we decided to audit what you've got. And I've got a copy of the audit that I did here. So some of the key findings were 25% of contacts don't have a company. 50% of contacts don't have a job title. 32% of contacts don't have a country. It was a kind of a, a typical record that I'd look at. And um, the title was Pam. The job title was 12 Smithfield Street. The address was 0207 246. The data was, was a mess. And there was no chance of doing any personalization or doing anything at all, any learning, because we just couldn't understand uh, who people were, even though we had all the data in place. So the first thing we did is we'd take all the data out, we passed it to a third party, they ran some algorithms over it and started to put data back into the, the correct columns. 
We then did an exercise to try and fill all, all the gaps. And actually, it's quite easy to fill some of the gaps just using other data that you've got. So if you've got an email address and it ends in .br, then you know that person's going to be based in Brazil. If you've got a, a phone number that starts with plus nine one, then that person's going to be based in, in India. So we, we spend a lot of time concentrating on the data, filling in the, the blanks, so we could actually start understanding our, our customer base. The other thing we took the opportunity to do was to actually look at how we are starting to capture data. So this is part of a, a form that sits on our website. The existing form that we had basically asked someone to fill in their full postal details to sign up for an EU newsletter. We don't do any direct mail. We don't need people's, people's address. Um, what's the point of collecting that data? So we, we thought kind of long and hard, what data are we going to need in the future to be able to segment, to be able to personalise? What information do we need now? Um, and we built the film accordingly. We've got a whole load of rules into the film to make sure we're capturing the, the right information. Um, making sure that the, the form is completely future-proofed for what we wanted to do further on with, with product development. So our first step on the sort of personalization journey, really, was to start using names within emails. So we've got, hello, Angela, within this email here. We started using names within subject lines, and that sort of uh, came part of our sort of subject line testing program. We did have a little bit of um, kickback from the, from the marketing teams. Um, it turned out we had a whole lot of initials in the database. So while we'd done the audit and go, yes, this field is completely populated, there's a whole load of initials in there. Um, and we had, got, we had a, an intern in one summer who kind of went through and just filled the names. A lot of the time you've got people's names because you've got their email address. So if, if my name's Bill.brand, then my name's going to be Bill. So easy to, to fill in. And one of my, my pet hates with emails is get a, an email that says, Dear Valued Customer. Now, if I was a valued customer, you would know my name. I, other pet hates are, are getting one, Dear Mrs. Brand, or Dear Bill with a lowercase b. Just basically shows that you don't care about your customers if you can't be bothered to get their, their names right. So we spent a lot of time just getting the, the basics right before we could even start doing some personalization. So names was the, was the first thing we looked at. Through part of the, the kind of audit process, we populated countries for all our, our records. Um, and this basically allowed two things. Firstly, allowed the editorial team to understand what the customer base looked like. So they now not only understood where customers were located, but what roles people had, uh, what industries they, they were worked in, so they could actually start writing content tailored towards those people. The other thing is that we have sponsorship of our, our newsletters, so we were able to basically create an additional advertising opportunity. Now, the investment uh, industry is highly regulated, and quite a lot of clients will put off advertising by us because we had global distribution. So if you're, you're kind of based in the, in the UK, and you've got a product which is only for the UK market, you can't seem to be advertising to people in Hong Kong, for example. Now we were able to segment our, our lists out, run multiple versions of the same, same newsletter with different advertising attached, which is a, a winner for everyone. So the, the sales team have got uh, more things to sell. For clients, they actually get advertising which is actually tailored um, more, more to them. Uh, and equally, Editorial started to better understand the customer, so we're able to improve the quality of the, of the content. The next step along our sort of personal journey was to start looking at our, our events business. Uh, and traditionally, we'd always got, we've got one event, we'll send one email out to, to everyone to tell them, tell them about it, and there'll be various different uh, versions of that. So the first thing we did was really to, to look at the types of people that we're trying to invite to our, our events. And we identified these three key pools. So those people who have previously attended events, those people who subscribe to magazines or newsletters, and then other prospects that fit into the right categories. Uh, and using the kind of the form that we originally set, which captured um, location and had captured industry type, we can feed all that into our segmentation pools. The next thing was to kind of work with the events team to really understand their cycle of communications and what elements they are putting into individual campaigns. Once we understood the event cycle and our segmentation groups, we were able to start compiling that together. So we ended up starting creating multiple versions, essentially, of the, of the same campaign. 
but with each one tailored to the different audience segments. And initially, the way we started doing this was actually just building a campaign with all the elements uh, attached and then simply copying it, adjusting the copy, changing some of the, the segments. So we ended up with basically three versions of the same email. Um, going forward, we want to start automating some of this, this, but our kind of starting point was trying to sort of prove um, that it actually worked, that the actual extra work into copying campaigns, more testing, started to have uh, an, an effect. We then started to apply this concept into other areas of the business. So we've just stopped printing one of our um, flagship publications and replaced it with an interactive digital version. So you used to have sort of one magazine and a, an email would go out to say the, the latest magazine's available, it's going to be in the post and there's a, like an online page turner version. We're now doing five regional versions of the, of the magazine uh, and when this got launched last month, 15 different emails went out. So there was not only one for each region, but within that there was a, a different content for people who got paper copy of the magazine, people who only got the page turner version, people who got the, the newsletter and didn't actually use to get a, uh, a magazine version. So just talking to people in, in slightly different ways. The actual the work we'd done on cleaning up our data and, and understanding our audience actually allowed us to produce the edition in, in the first place because we were confident that we knew exactly where people were based, because we knew the types of people we are. That all, all that hard work got fed into the uh, development of the, of the product. The other thing we, we put in place is, is a preference centre. So basically we put in the hands of the customer the power for them to decide exactly what communications they want to receive from us. So their preferences are then added into the, the segmentation um, pools that we've already decided to put together. So we have not only what we think people should be receiving, but the customers themselves are telling us what they want to, to receive. So, was all this extra work worth it? And it has been extra work. There's more campaigns to create. There's more campaigns to test. Um, so this is looking at our, our newsletters. And the, the first chart here is showing year-on-year -year open rates. Um, and obviously there's, there's a clear upward lift uh, across the year. And if I put the previous year um, on the chart, it would have sat, sat below. The second graph looks at um, okay, click to open rates. And again, we've got a nice steady, steady increase uh, across the two years. When we look at our, our events business, um, the trend lines say the same, same sort of story. Uh, the first one, open rates, there's a few more sort of peaks and troughs, and I think that's just kind of a reflection of the volume of events we're doing. Um, there are times in the year where we've got no events going out at all, so there'll be less, less emails going out. But the overall trend is an improvement on, on open rates. And the, the click-through rates same, tell the same story. What has also become apparent is that the effectiveness of the emails is driving more traffic to the website. So a few years ago, 40% of all traffic to our, our four key uh, brand websites, totaled about 40%, it's now about 60%. And we can see, that, see the rise and that's how important emails come to actually getting people to the website. And if we go back to the, the business original kind of visions and, and desires, which was to increase engagement, to get more traffic to the site, to create more, more page impressions, emails delivering that. The other knock on effect has been that Overall traffic to the, all their sites has increased, and the, the reason for this is all because of, of email. One of the other things that we've, we've noticed has changed is that the way people are signing up to events has changed. So we've got a, a kind of audience development team who used to spend a lot of time on the phone actually recruiting people to, to events. Um, and it used to be spent the case that 63% sort of, of people were signed up to an event because people actually called them. Three years later, because the quality of the emails has improved, 61% of people sign off for back of emails. So we've become a lot more efficient internally, we've spent a lot less time on the phone, and the audience development, time, uh, audience development team have got more time to actually spend building relationships with clients rather than chasing them to see if they will come along to, to an event. So what's kind of next? 
personalization is for us is very much a journey. It's do something, test it, get it working, move on to the next, next stage. And what we've introduced last year was a, a content wall. So we've got premium content behind the, behind the website, and if you want to read that content, then you need to sign up and fill in the form that we, we designed and, and talked about earlier. What that means is that now when people consume content on the website, we are collecting all the categories and tags against every sort of article uh, that people consume. Our next desire is to start building emails which are based entirely on people consume. So essentially using AI. If we know people are interested in tax stories, then let's put those stories at the top. If we know people are interested in offshore bonds, then let's make sure those stories go to the top. So actually learning from what people are actually likely to, to consume. I just finally, just on GPI, GDPR, just because that's what everyone is talking about. We've all got to audit our, our databases. Um, we've all got to audit them for make sure we've got the right permissions in place. So let's, let's audit our databases to actually look at the quality of data as well. And if we've got good quality data that's completed the right, the right information on the forms to gather the right permission, then that really goes hand in hand with the ability to start personalise, personalising our, our content. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I think it shows that personalisation is, is a lot of work. But actually, you know, some of the results you've seen are really, really impressive. So the work is worth it. Um, so those of you that read the blurb um, will know that this uh, is an interactive session. So now I'm going to ask you guys uh, to get involved. Uh, so we've come up with uh, four different scenarios. I won't uh, get you to guess what they are based on these random pictures. <laughs> but basically, we've got a retailer, we've got a charity, um, we've got a B2B publisher, a bit like Last Word Media, some clues there maybe. And uh, we've also got a consumer event, a home improvement event. Um, so my colleagues are just going around and they're putting your, a ca one case study on each table. So I want you to um, work together as a team um, to answer these uh, three questions. So after saying that personalization is a lot of work, I'm basically asking you to come up with a personalization strategy in about 20 minutes, but you know, no, no problem, you'll be fine. Um, so uh, just to kind of get everybody um, warmed up, first of all, I'm just going to sort of talk through some of the different types of data that uh, are available to us as marketers. Uh, so uh, on my data tree, I've got uh, behavioral data at the top of the tree. So this is all um, the, you know, stuff like email opens, email clicks, uh, also, website data, what products are your customers looking at on your website, uh, what things are they putting in their basket and maybe leaving behind. Um, but all this data is like gold dust for marketers because it's the, um, it, it shows, it has the strongest um, uh, indication of uh, an immediate intent to purchase. Uh, so if you can utilize that data, then uh, that tends to have a, ve a very, very strong ROI. Um, some examples there. Uh, second, I've got transactional data. So that's all your uh, pr uh, purchase history data. So that's giving you really useful information on what products people have purchased previously, uh, how frequently they shop with you, how much they typically spend. And that's all good data that you can use to personalize your marketing. And finally, um, we've got customer data. So this is all that, all that good stuff that customers um, will tell you about themselves. So maybe if they fill, on, fill in a form online, uh, they uh, register on your website, or perhaps they fill in your, your preferences form. But um, you know, really useful st stuff like uh, name, where they live, gender, uh, date of birth. And perhaps also, you know, something a bit about themselves, about their interests, their hobbies, you know, nice stuff that you can use to be more personalised in your approach. And if you collect that kind of information, then, um, as Bill said, you know, only collect what you need to use, and once you've collected it, make sure you use it, because there is an expectation that you've created there. So uh, next, um, just thinking about um, what we've got uh, in our personalisation kit bag. Um, so, first of all, personalised and conditional content. So, obviously, pers obviously bringing in 
first name to an email you know, is, a, is a really effective touch, but you can also bring in um, other information based on location or job titles, company names, etc., cetera, um, to make that uh, email sound more personal. Uh, you can also use um, conditional or, or dynamic content. So in a, you know, a very simple way, um, perhaps showing uh, an image of a, a woman to your female customers, an image of a man to your, your male customers, and you can create rules uh, in order to do that. Um, second, we've got uh, life cycle stage programs. So that's your welcome programs, uh, maybe re-engagement programs for people who are, are less engaged with the emails that you're sending. Uh, you've also got your behavioral driven programs, so things like abandoned basket, um, abandoned browse. Uh, thirdly, we've got um, recommendations. Uh, so you heard, um, it was Sean from eConsultancy, was, you probably can't remember that, that was so long ago this morning, but he talked about the Naked Wines example where they've generated um, personalised uh, wine recommendations based on what people have purchased previously, what they've reviewed, um, typically how much they spend, etc. Um, so often um, you, can, you can use a recommendations engine, uh, you can work with them, different technology companies in order to generate those recommendations or you might generate them in-house using um, certain algorithms. Uh, finally, we've got contextual personalization, which, um, which you might overlook, but that's um, all about um, making the email relevant um, to the time and place that your recipient opens it. So that could be something as simple as um, uh, optimizing for the device, so making sure you've got mobile responsive design in your emails, um, but it could also um, be you know, using some of the new functionality which allows you to do things like countdown clocks, or um, perhaps an example from Costa Coffee, um, where when you open the email, they'll actually tell you where the nearest Costa Coffee shop is, which would have been really useful for me this morning when I got up very early and travelled from Reading. Um, so there's lots, you know, there's lots of different things that you can consider as um, part of your personalisation strategy. So um, I think you've all got your, your case studies on the table. Um, so yeah, um, I'd just like you to get stuck in, and there's lots of pedestrians around if you want to ask any questions. that you're all so engrossed that, that's amazing um, but um, it's nearly coffee time so I have to stop you um, but I'd really really like to hear um, back from some of the some of the teams um, so have I got anybody who, who volunteers anyone who's excited to share what you've been talking about no <laughs> that doesn't surprise me um, so anybody got the retail case study who's got the retail you guys yeah, you start then, you start. So um, how, did, how did you find it? A tough, a tough ask? Not much time? A breeze. A breeze. So what, what kind of stuff did you... So the retail case study was basically a, a baby clothes retailer. Yeah. So what kind of ideas did you come up with? Well, I, I actually wanted to start with uh, one of the challenges, which I think you became quite late, I think it's great one because the assumption that all of the requirements that the people that are shopping are buying for themselves. Yeah. And I think that in that industry, in that children's clothes particularly, that could be particularly contentious if you get that bit wrong. Yeah. So actually understanding people's behaviour online before marketing them at all is probably the right thing to do. And yeah. understanding the types of stuff that they're doing. Yeah, so you're thinking like gift purchases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or awful for me, yeah, to get yeah. <laughs> um, but then, then there's, we had a ton of stuff around understanding either what stage of pregnancy they were at or, or how old their children were and looking at that from both a behavioural and a self-declared data point of view. Uh, maybe offering initiatives for sign-up to give some of that information so that you can either give them a, a voucher on their child's birthday or on the birth date of the baby. Um, and then put beyond personalising just to the people we were talking to personalising the emails to their children as well. So you're talking about how little Johnny would love this um, soup or whatever. Um, doing business as usual stuff, so still sending a single email perhaps when they've got their site wide sale and personalising that. 
And again, pulling that data from transactional, from self-declared behavioral stuff that they've done before. Um, and then looking at how you can, we can model uh, all of the different users based on that payroll information and then create a decent virtual world program. Cool. That sounds really good. That's, that's pretty thorough, actually, considering the time you had. <laughs> well done. That's brilliant. Um, cool. Did anyone get the charity case study? So cool. Yeah. So th this one was um, kind of saving endangered species, basically, wasn't it? And they're uh, talking to s different supporters of the charity. Apparently, we've been aggressive with our emails in the past. So yeah. Consider that as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, we only got through a couple of the objectives. Um, the first one was to convert one-off. Uh, donators to kind of get regular um, donations. Um, so we kind of uh, came up with the idea of a, a post donation uh, program based on the specific animal that they've donated for, yeah, nice. which would then tell them this is where your money's gone to. So it'd be a content email um, showing the projects or the work that's been done to save that specific animal. Um, and at the same time, kind of gently try and upsell them to a regular donation. So yeah. this is where more money could take us. These are future projects, yeah, that kind of thing. Good. And then optimize it based on kind of number of days from purchase date. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was our first yeah, one. That's really interesting. Yeah. One of our clients has recently done just that testing. I guess the, um, it was Parkinson's actually, if you mm. went to the automation mm. base camp. I did, I stole ah. from it literally. <laughs> 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 that's really cool. So sorry, I'm interested. Uh, and the, uh, the other part was improving the existing support to experience. So it was, it was kind of similar. Um, so segmenting um, their, their kind of campaign by um, the interests they've submitted, their purchase history. Um, so looking at the specific animals again that they've um, shown an interest in um, and also um, determining because of the our point about having sent too many emails and having a huge unsubscribe rate, um, determining frequency as well based on email responsiveness. Yeah, um, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so that's all we've got to. That's, that's brilliant. That's really, really good. Well done, guys. In 20 minutes, that's not bad. <laughs> cool. Um, did anyone get the, um, the event case study, the home improvement event? Who's got that? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah, if you could um, yeah, share some of the, your thoughts. So, yeah, this is a big like, I ideal home show, basically. Yeah, we have a lot of fun with um, retaining our game attendance is a big um, yeah. understanding. I think we're discussing about how people might be doing up their home one year and they're not doing it the next because they'll be broke. So, um, yeah. a bit about re around retention marketing, um, so behavioural um, targeting in terms of did they attend last year and then see um, showing the messaging is appropriate for saying come back and see us again. Um, and then some stuff around um, conditional content in the um, email to make it nice and relevant to them. Um, I don't know if anyone else done at this stage. Um, <laughs> so looking at browsing behaviour and then previous interaction with campaigns um, and purchase history in the past as well. Um, and then trying to upsell as well to increase ticket sales. So perhaps if someone's already purchased, then offering a um, discount for a friend to join them or That's a good something idea. those lines. Yeah. And again, looking at the registration data and behaviour. Yeah. Nice. nice. Well done. Cool. Good Thanks. job. Good job. <laughs> so did anyone get the uh, the financial publisher one uh, that was you guys cool so yeah any any thoughts anything that bill bill hasn't thought of yet <laughs> um, yeah i think it was, it was looking at conditional content by vertical so what was relevant to the end reader but looking at geographically but possibly cross-selling yeah. so someone in hong kong might be interested in the london one if they're traveling to leave with a primary geographical one, but then consider suggesting other options. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, one good of the point. challenges of that is obviously if it's being run out of London, how do you do it in native language? Yeah. Having taken the client into Japan, you know, it's quite difficult to try and do that with a copy and email copy. You've yeah. never got a Japanese key. No, no, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's quite interesting your point about, you know, if they're travelling, because sometimes you can almost personalise too much. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? You sort of give people what they've had before, but it's not necessarily what they might be interested in. I think it comes back to one of the points earlier, wasn't it, when they were saying around the, the wine, it might be, mm. you might always buy that sort of red wine. Yeah. But actually, 
giving some effort that you've put some thoughts into it say a lot of people buy this but they also quite like this champagne or yeah. just try that crossword to increase the average order value. Yeah, so I'm giving it that human touch, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not just yeah, a machine doing it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great stuff. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it was really interesting to hear back from everybody. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed um, the experience of coming up with a, a strategy in, in 20 minutes. Um, but <laughs> so yeah, well done. I think it's time for coffee now. So cool. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.